Hello and welcome to this Electrical Principles training video. In a previous video in this series, we looked at what happened when we took a coil and connected it to a DC supply and then to an AC supply. We took various readings of voltage and current. You can see those on the screen in the top left hand corner now. And then we proceeded to calculate uh, the resistance of the coil, the impedance of the coil, the inductive reactance and the inductance of the coil. In this video, we're going to continue doing our calculations and figure out what the power factor of the coil was the phase angle will also produce a graph of that uh, phase angle between the voltage and the current and then we'll figure out what size of capacitor we would need to install if we wanted to correct that power factor so let's get on with the rest of our calculations the next thing we're going to do is to try and calculate the power factor now the power factor of a circuit is very easy to find as long as you know two of the values relating to the circuit. The way that we'll do it in this circuit, because we don't have, uh, we've not broken the AC voltage down into its resistive voltage and its inductive voltage, but we do know the resistance and the impedance. So that means that we can use this formula. The power factor is equal to R over Z. At this point, if any of this looks unfamiliar to you, if this is being kind of lobbed at you from nowhere, then please go back and watch my AC theory playlist that features on my channel, because this is going to really help you out understanding where all of these formulas have come from. This is kind of the application of lots and lots of previous information. So let's find our uh, power factor. So we've got 117.42 divided by 461.3. So again, we'll pop that into the calculator, 117.42 divided by 461.3, and that comes out looking like 0.25. So you can see there that we have got a really, really poor power factor in this circuit. We have got 0.25 for our power factor, which is very, very poor indeed. That is a, a quite terrible power factor. I think what I'll do at this stage, if I run it off to three decimal places, because that's going to make the next stage a little bit more accurate. So look at the four, the number after it is a five, so that means we're going to round this up to become five. So we've got 0.255 as the power factor. Now remember that there is no units on power factor, it's just a ratio, and effectively it's the ratio between two sides of a triangle, which brings us really nice and neatly onto the next part of the calculation. The next part of the calculation is to try and find the phase angle. Now the phase angle is the angle that the voltage and the current are out of phase by. So this is an inductive circuit, so we know that the current is lagging the voltage. So what that means is that we can use some information that we've calculated so far to figure out what the phase angle is. And that information actually comes from here, because what we did here was we used the value of resistance divided by the value of impedance. And actually, if you remember back to a previous video in this series, you'll remember that we can represent the relationships between resistance, reactance, and impedance in an AC circuit by using a right angle triangle. Now, at this point here, we're interested in this angle, because this angle here is also the same angle that the current and voltage are out of phase by. So what that means is that when we did R divided by Z, we actually did the adjacent of this triangle divided by the hypotenuse. Again, if you're not sure about your trigonometry, please go and watch my video that I made on that, and it'll hopefully help you to understand what we're doing here a little bit more. Now, it's worth noting that power factor is also equal to the cosine of theta, theta being the angle that current and voltage are out of phase by. So what that means is that if we want to find the angle of this, we know that the cosine of theta, which is the same as the power factor, and the power factor is 0.255. So what that means is that if we want to find the angle, theta, we need to carry out the following kind of transposition. What we're going to do is we're going to find the inverse cosine of 0.255. Five, like that. So that's what we're going to find here, the inverse cosine of 0.255. Now what this means is that those of you who perhaps went to school a number of years ago may remember that before the advent of scientific calculators, we had books that were absolutely full of pages and pages of angles 
with columns next to them that showed you their sine values, their cosine values, and their tangent values. And you'd look up uh, this value in the table, 0.255, or as near as you could get to it, and then you would scan across the columns and look at what the angle theta was. Well, in a way, all of that information is now contained in our calculators. So all we do is we press shift and we press cos, and that brings up this symbol here. Sometimes this is referred to as the inverse cosine or the arc cosine. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're just basically asking the calculator, please can you tell me what is the angle that has a cosine of 0.255? And the calculator will figure out what that is, and it will tell us that theta is equal to 75 point, uh, let's go with 2 degrees. So this angle here is 75.2 degrees, and the angle that the voltage and the current are out of phase by. So here's our voltage and here's our current. So this is the voltage into the circuit and the current that is flowing into the circuit. They're out of phase by 75.2 degrees, not drawn to scale. So now we know the phase angle. We know how far the current is lagging the voltage by in this circuit. So now we've figured out the phase angle that's occurring within our coil, that angle between the voltage and the current in our circuit. What we can now do is represent that on a graph as a wave diagram. So I'm using uh, the graphing calculator at desmos.com and I'm going to show you how we can set this up to show what's happening with the voltage and the current inside our circuit. So if I first of all just change the settings, click on this little spanner here and change the settings to uh, degrees, so that's the first thing that we're going to do. Now we want to show this happening across, uh, let's say, three full cycles. So we'll go from minus 10 degrees on the x-axis to this point, which will be, if we put that at 1100, that takes us past the 1080 that would represent three full rotations. And on the y-axis, on this graph, we're not going to worry too much about the uh, vertical values about the peak values of our waveforms. We're just interested in showing that phase shift. So if we go from minus, uh, let's say minus 1.5 on the y-axis up to 1.5, we've now got the stage set so that we can create our uh, waveform on here. So we'll just close the spanner down and then we'll type the formulas into uh, the bars over here. So first of all, to create a sine wave, if we just type in y equals the sine of x, so what that's doing is it's taking every uh, sort of angle along the x-axis and treating it uh, as an angle in degrees, and then it's finding the sine of that, that, that value and plotting it as the y value. So we could use this to represent our voltage waveform. So if we now want to put in our current waveform, we simply type in y equals the sine of x again. And you can see that's created this green waveform. I'd like it to be blue. Uh, I don't know why, I just always use blue for my current values. So there we go, we've got our current waveform in blue now. And what we're going to do here is show that there is a lagging phase angle of 75.2 degrees. So if we put in minus 75.2, now you'll notice that the blue waveform has completely disappeared and what's happened is it's been moved way down the graph. So if we were to go way down here, we'd find that all the way down at the bottom. So what we can do, instead of uh, just completely losing the waveform and it not actually being of any value, if we put our x minus 75.2 in brackets, you can see that we've created uh, our current waveform. And what you can see happening here is there we've got our... Uh, voltage waveform peaking at 90 degrees and our current waveform is now peaking at 165.2 degrees which means that the current waveform is hitting all of its kind of significant points 75.2 degrees after the voltage waveform has hit its uh, kind of significant points. In reality it's all the points, it's just very obvious when you look at two points that really stand out on the graph. So you can see here, if we do 165.2, take away 90, we end up with a phase angle here, a difference between the waveforms of 75.2 degrees. So now we could print that out, or we could uh, take a screenshot of that and annotate it if we wanted to, and therefore we've got a copy of our waveform.
The final thing that we need to do now is figure out if we want to correct this terrible power factor and bring the current and the voltage back into phase with each other, we need to figure out what size capacitor to connect into this circuit. Now we can do that by, uh, let's say we want to find the capacitance. The first thing that we need to acknowledge and remember is that if we had a capacitive circuit, then it would look something like this. Okay, and we would have our value for XC here. So this is still resistance, this is still impedance, but the capacitive reactance points in the opposite direction to the inductive reactance. So what that means is that our uh, capacitance, if we want to know what capacitive reactance is for the circuit to counteract the inductive reactance, we have to acknowledge that capacitive reactance and inductive reactance need to be the same. And if you remember from a previous video, to calculate capacitive reactance, we use the formula that looks like this, 1 over 2 pi Fc. Now, we want to get C by itself, so we're not interested in Xc. We already know that. We know the frequency. We know these constants. We want to know what C is. So to do that, first of all, we think, right, what's happening with this C? Well, at the minute, it's kind of trapped under here as a divider. So what that means we've got to do is we've got to multiply both sides by this whole chunk under here. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by that big chunk. So we end up with xc times 2 pi times f times c would be equal to 1. And then we want to get c by itself. Well, at the minute, on this side, we are multiplying c by this whole chunk. So the opposite of multiplying by this whole chunk is to divide by that whole chunk which brings us to this point. C is equal to 1 over xc 2 pi f. And now we can put our numbers into that calculation. So we end up with C is equal to 1 over xc had a value of the same as xl, and xl was 446.1. So we times that by 2, times that by pi, and then times that by the frequency of 50, and that's going to give us our answer. So there we go, we can do 1 over 2 times pi times uh, 50, and I've forgotten to put the x in, so I'll go back and put that in now, 446.1, and there goes our answer. Now what's interesting about this is the calculator has returned this in the proper way. It said 1.427, times 10 to the minus 5. But we don't have a kind of a, an engineering prefix that corresponds to times 10 to the minus 5. So what we need to do is we push this beautiful little button on our calculator marked ENG. All of my learners initially think that that means English, which it absolutely does not. Okay, It means engineering. And when we do that, we end up with 14.27, and that's times 10 to the minus 6. So we replace that with the symbol micro, and of course that's in farads. So if we were to connect a capacitor into this circuit that had a value of 14.27 microfarads, we would correct this poor power factor, and that would give us a circuit that was operating much more efficiently, and actually we'd find that it reduced the current flow into the circuit as well. So I'm sure you'll agree we have produced an awful lot of information just based on some measures of voltage and current, and also the periodic time, which we, we kind of already knew, the frequency. And so it's amazing just what you can find out by, from a coil just by having a couple of uh, AC and DC supplies and then performing some very clever measurements and calculations. Thank you very much for watching.